For Chandrayaan 2, it was launched with nine in situ in uh, instruments, but Chandrayaan 3 uh, apparently goes with only one instrument, uh, which is the spectro uh, polarimetry of habitable planetary Earth. It's an instrument called SHAPE. If you can just shed some light on that, what exactly uh, no, is the use? I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a, I'm not a uh, planetary physicist. I wouldn't know much about that. I'm more, more of a rocket scientist. Right, absolutely, sir. And lastly, of course, uh, Chandrayaan 2, uh, as far as design is concerned, uh, the Chandrayaan 3 design, we've been hearing this term failure-based design a lot. What exactly is that, sir? Yes, so um, there is there is quite a bit of, uh, quite, quite a few different control uh, laws that actually uh, are used. One of them is a time-based control, the other one is an event-based control, third one is a failure-based control. And event-based and failure-based are somewhat related. So you actually take a decision based on what you have achieved versus what you need to achieve. And that decision, so there are always sensors on board that are telling us what is the current situation of the vehicle versus what it is supposed to do. And therefore, the next control that we need to do should actually be based on that. Um, so failure-based control is all about looking at all these different failure modes. And when you now actually reach a particular failure mode, what should be the next action that is taken and so on. This is actually now routinely att attempted. For example, even the SL, the SSLV actually had that uh, the, that issue. The first launch of SSLV also actually went based on a failure mode. Uh, in fact, and then that that failed for for uh, another reason. But uh, failure mode based control is actually something that's very common these days, where it looks for uh, what are the different failure modes that are possible, and when you now have a particular failure mode, what should be the next course of action that is taken? So that's an onboard computer that makes a decision based on that and and acts accordingly, so that you will salvage the mission every at every uh, turn of uh, uh, events. Absolutely, thank you so much, sir, for that uh, exhaustive explanation on uh, some of the changes, and of course, what we're putting out on our screens right now is just simply some of the new additions uh, in Chandrayaan three. It has a uh, you know, a laser uh, a retro reflector array. It has more fuel for the Vikram lander and it also has a laser Doppler velocity meter. So these are just some of the new additions. And with that, let me bring in some of our other guests back into the broadcast as well, who've been waiting patiently with us. Let me begin with Vinkamara Sudhakaran. Vinkamara Sudhakaran, of course, uh, everybody is waiting with a lot of uh, anticipation, sir. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, you know, these things have become a habit as of now. So I wouldn't say we are very surprised because uh, we keep springing up a new surprise, whether it in the space or whether it in land or air. So, uh, you know, we are no longer an aspirational superpower. Uh, so, uh, you know, it is wrong to say that uh, everybody's expecting because this has become a norm for us. So while we say it is a norm, we can't undermine this particular achievement because this is really touching the moon, right? We are touching the sky with glory, surpassing it and landing on the moon. The next, of course, will be to put a human there, which we are, uh, which we are going to uh, uh, do it in due course of time with the pact that we had with uh, the Americans. Uh, so, you know, looks like there is a, a long journey on course because the scientific temper in this community has, uh, in this society has been now given some kind of course, some kind of direction and some kind of destination. Uh, we still need a long way to go. We need to put the policies in place. Uh, wherein the uh, money has to be put in the right place. You know, I, I've been complaining to the government about, you know, not getting the JERD ratio right. The GDP to the R&D ratio, that's roughly around 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 percentage. We need to get it somewhere around 4 to 5 percentage because of the population, because of the capacity that we have. If we really need to exploit, you know, put our young minds towards, you know, touching the skies, touching the moon, you know, exploring the Mars, going into, uh, uh, you know, interstellar uh, travel. Uh, these could look like dream, but, you know, these are real-time possibilities. Uh, yes, uh, we have been slowly aggregating towards this achievement in the past. 
but we've caught pace. We've started accelerating. Uh, the Chandrayaan 2 shouldn't have been a failure ideally, but for those small errors like Professor Satya Chakravarti rightly brought out that, you know, uh, it was just that it toppled and the communication, even if it had, you know, toppled and then uh, maintained the line of sight to, you know, give that communication, we would have still salvaged and we would have not called it as a total loss. Or, or a failure, but then it is okay. It is all right to fail. When we fail, we learn more and we learn how not to fail the next time. And uh, this time, you know, the preparations of ISRO has been, uh, you know, what is, what meets to the, uh, uh, meets to our eyes sitting from outside. Of course, I'm not privy to what has happened inside, but then what has come out outside is, there is a tremendous preparation that has gone in. Uh, Prime Minister, for the first time, is not in the country. Ideally, he should be, uh, you know, if he was in the country, he would be in the operational center, chairing, egging people. Uh, Absolutely. You know, but but he's, he's, uh, made, he's made a big chair in France, sir. To have done it. But then that also goes on to show the confidence uh, that he has in the scientific community. And he knows this time uh, they will be 200 percentage sure of success. And I hope... Uh, you know, keep, though I keep my fingers crossed, pray to God, you know, though we are all scientists and research professionals, but then we still are spiritually oriented. We look up to that divine intervention. So like the scientists there went to Tirupati, got the blessing. So I hope everything will fare well and then we'll get the results that we desired of Chandrayaan 3. You know, let's not knock anymore in the super power club. Let's go and claim our seats. Absolutely, sir. I'll come back to you in just a moment. Let me bring in uh, Mr. Ravi Gupta as well. He's a former DRDO scientist, but uh, we'll also put out a quick video uh, released by ISRO on some of the instruments that will now be landing on the moon. Have a look. Chandrayaan-3 lander has four scientific instruments or payloads of which one will study the moon quakes while the other one studies as to how the surface of the moon allows heat to flow through it. The third one will study the plasma environment near the moon's surface. And the fourth instrument will enable scientists to measure the distance between the Earth and moon very accurately. The two instruments on the rover help us study the composition of the moon's surface using X-rays and laser, respectively. While the lander and rover will be in direct contact with each other, the propulsion module circling the moon will observe the light coming from Earth, the only planet which we know which is definitely teeming with life. This observation will help in understanding the nature of distant planets circling stars other than the Sun. All right, and we'll take uh, the next few minutes to just go through some of these instruments in much greater detail uh, with Ms. Ravi Gupta, if we can, sir. Of course, uh, last time around also, we spoke extensively about the lander and the rover. We've put out some of those major specifications. So as far as the lander is concerned, the mission life is one lunar day which is uh, 14 Earth days. The mass of the lander is 1,749.86 kgs, including the rover. It has three payloads. The dimensions are on the screens and it can also communicate back to Earth. And the landing site, of course, viewers, has also been put out very specifically. And as far as the rover is concerned, the mission life is the same as the lander, 14 Earth days. The mass is just a mere 26 kgs. The payloads are two dimensions, of course, on your screens and it communicates directly with the lander. So, sir, if you can just help explain to our viewers how exactly do these instruments collect information and how is that information then relayed back to Earth? Yeah, see, <coughs> these uh, instruments, uh, see, what the similar information we have been collecting through the orbiter. But there is a lot of difference. Uh, in collecting the information from 100 kilometer away uh, distance and uh, actually in situ uh, analysis of these with in much greater detail and much more fineness. So that is it. The thermal conductivity of this uh, crust, it is not possible to measure from a distance 
So uh, the lander will be going there and it is measuring the temperature, inserting a probe into the Earth's uh, uh, regolith and uh, the me measurement of the, 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 how, the way, the how heat conducts through this crust. So this is, has an important bearing on what we need to do apart from revealing the nature of the regolith it also uh, will give you insight into the future design aspect when, when you want to set up your uh, some kind of a base at the moon. Then similarly, uh, as we know that the uh, moon does not have an atmosphere, but the, the kind of atmosphere we have on Earth, it, that air is not there. Uh, at the outer reaches of Earth's atmosphere, we have something called exosphere. And uh, that exosphere, uh, that is totally ionized form. Now, what similar kind of uh, exosphere we have right on the moon's surface. So, this uh, another probe on the lander will be studying the characteristics of this uh, this exosphere. Uh, this, this is basically a plasma. Absolutely. Plasma means that the, the atoms mm -hmm. and whatever molecules are there, they are in this totally ionized form. Okay. So, not only what is there, what are their characteristics. <laughs> they will be measuring their characteristics in real time. So, how does it change? We know that it is changing. When the sun, sun is shining, the characteristics are different. When the sun is not there, the characteristics are different. So, these again will have important bearing on when we want to... Uh, nature of moon at the same time, when you want to set up a base at the moon. Absolutely. And so we'll quickly also just go over some of the instruments on... Uh, the lander and the rover, sir. So, the lander has one instrument to, as you were uh, pointing out, measure the near surface plasma density and how it changes with time. Then, it also has another instrument to carry out measurements of thermal properties of the lunar surface near the polar region and a third instrument to measure the seismicity around the landing site and the delineating uh, of the structure of the lunar crust and the mantle. So, this is what the lander payloads will be able to test and assess. And what we uh, understand is that the lander is not only talking to the rover, but it's also talking to the orbiter and then the signals, of course, uh, are being sent back to ISRO. Right on. Exactly. This is, this is what it is. Uh, the, the, the lander will be collecting the information. Basically, it is a kind of a, you can say, um, a labot, small laboratory where it will collect the data in real time and it will be continuously sent to the uh, orbiter whereby <coughs> it will be retransmitted to the Earth. So, that's how it is working. Absolutely. And besides, if we can just quickly uh, we discuss lab, the... Behind, besides, yes. we have the rover. The rover has another two instruments. Uh, which will be collecting the uh, from uh, in situ analysis, chemical analysis of the uh, earth, uh, whatever soil is there. So that will, that will be done because the rover is mobile. The lander is static at one place, wherever it lands, it lands there. But the rover will be able to move around and collect, uh, the, carry out the studies at different, different locations around the uh, lander. Uh, not going too far away from the lander so that it always remains in communication with the lander. At the same time, sir, it is uh, it is the instruments on the lander that actually uh, study as far as, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the presence of water or water ice on the moon is concerned. Am I correct? Yeah, the, yeah, definitely. <clears throat> No, but at the same time, uh, the, as far as the, 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 not only the lander, but also uh, we have been collecting uh, evidence uh, from the moon, our orbiter also in the last uh, four years, three years, that has been going on. Because that, that, that way we are co collecting data from the entire moon. And that's why we know that the, the possibility of finding water is much more than uh, in the South Polar region. But yes, nevertheless, you are right. The rover, uh, the lander will be doing experiments to collect the for the con for the confirmation of our presence of water. But I tell you, it may not be there because the water we are not likely to find water on the surface. There, uh, there, there is very less likelihood of finding water molecules or ice right on the surface itself. So okay. uh, that that is likely to be further buried down, down deep into the. That is the reason. See, this thermal conductivity experiment. That is the importance of that. It will tell you how deep you are able to find water. What, what, what is the likelihood of finding water 
uh, at subsurface level and to what extent to what depth okay wing commander sudhakar and i leave the last word to you sir uh, we're running out of time but uh, as far as uh, the discovery of water or water ice is concerned what sort of a, how will that be a game changer if india does uh, at least help uh, you know add more to whatever we know so far uh see uh, i i wouldn't be able to tell at this point of time whether it will be a game changer or not you know let's not hype everything that we do in the realm of science but then the very capability that you are able to land onto another planet you know uh, explore uh, uh, things there understand what happens there that itself is a capability in itself that's one part second part is you know you are building technologies which can prove in all kinds of environments because unless and until you have this kind of challenge somebody wouldn't know what are the design practices processes that you would need to actually master to be able to undertake this kind of a mission now those technologies can have a lot of use cases uh, even you know not in moon but in earth itself so uh, these are this is how the uh, native industry will grow our our understanding and knowledge about uh, the latest processes the methods tools everything will go to a next trend and then the more bigger the challenge we will then scout for better tools we will make better tools for ourselves which means that our day to day life you know those tools will have uh, side use cases and that is more important when we talk about you know there are a lot of guys naysayers who say when the country is you know suffering from uh, you know out of poverty there are so many people who are unemployed why do they invest so much money in space but right. they don't understand they don't under what they don't understand is it's the technology that comes out of space that actually catalyzes the economy on ground and that's more important you can find Absolutely. water on moon I'm not saying drawing a pipeline, taking that water and bringing it here, but then the capability to do so, that actually takes you to two notches higher, and then you sit in the League of Nations, you know, which are a handful. That's more important. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon.